Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the scriptures teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, good to see everybody back again, and uh, we're going to move right on into our next half hour, which will be from Daniel chapter 2, and we're going to drop in at verse 44. And again, for those of you joining us on television, again, we want to thank you for your letters, for your financial help, but most of all, for your prayers. My, we just got back from a week in Florida, and everybody that goes by says we pray for you every day. Well, what more could I ask for? So uh, continue to do that, because without the prayers of the saints, we'd probably be in trouble in no time. All right, we're going to pick right up in our study of Daniel, and uh, back to chapter 2, verse 44, for those of you here in the studio, and for those of you joining us out there in television, we appreciate again that you let us know that you take notes and that you're learning how to study on your own. All right, after the description of the Roman Empire, as we ended in our last half hour, and uh, we put it up here on the board, and we still left it up here, how that the Babylonians were the head of gold, the chest of silver, the Medes and the Persians, Greece was the part of brass of that great image, remember? And then the last part, the legs of iron, were a, an empire that they couldn't even describe. And, of course, we know from the history that the Roman Empire was awesome. The Roman legions were feared from one end of the then known world to the other. But uh, they, too, went down into the dustbin of history and uh, disappeared from view until, you might say, after World War II, now we have a reappearance again of what we call the revived Roman Empire, which will entail much the same geographical area as the original Roman Empire. And that, of course, will be the ten toes of clay and iron. But we're going to pick it up now in verse 44. In the days of these kings, in other words, when these revived Roman Empire nations have come together, and I still feel I've taught it for 30-some years, that it'll be the original ten nations of Western Europe who formed the Club of Rome and later on became the European community. And even though they've now added and added, yet the original ten are pretty much in, uh, in control. All right, so they're going to be the empire of the Antichrist in the closing seven years. And so that's where we pick them up now. This revived Roman Empire out of which the Antichrist has come and the seven years will run their course, and then the next event is the kingdom on earth. And again, I'm realizing more and more that precious few church people, let alone the unchurched world, yeah, got heads nodding all over, they don't know what you're talking about. A kingdom on earth? See, they think we're the kingdom. I'll never forget a couple in one of my classes here in Oklahoma years ago went to a Bible conference here in, in Oklahoma. And they came back and they said, Les, all they talked about for the whole several days of Bible conference, we got to build the kingdom. We got to fill the kingdom. Well, we're not in the kingdom. Heavens, no, we're not in the kingdom. The kingdom is that which is still future when Christ will return and be the king of kings on planet Earth from his headquarters in Jerusalem. We are in the body of Christ. We're not building the kingdom per se. We're building the body of Christ. All right, so now in verse 44, here we have the introduction from Daniel's appearance of this earthly kingdom over which God the Son will yet one day rule. Verse 44, Daniel chapter 2. And in the days of these kings, in other words, these final ten kings that comprised the Roman, revived Roman Empire, out of which the Antichrist has come. In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven. Now, you see, this is the term of the biblical God in the book of Daniel. The God of heaven. And even Nebuchadnezzar is going to come to this point in a future chapter where he recognizes the God of heaven or the most high God is another term. All right, and this God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, 
and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, as all these previous ones have. You see, when the Medes and the Persians overran the Babylonians, they kept most of what the Babylonians had established, and all the way down through the Gentile Empire, they would keep what had been before. But here we have the opposite. Nobody is going to be able to take over anything of this kingdom. All right? And it shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdom. In other words, all the empire builders of the present day age, the global system as we now see it coming on the scene, will be utterly destroyed and Christ will return and set up his kingdom. Now verse 44, the last four verses, it'll stand forever. Now that's the terminology. Even though Revelation says a thousand years, Yet this kingdom is going to go right on into eternity as an earthly kingdom. Now, the, just, just to tantalize your thinking, I'm not going to stop and teach on this, but come all the way back to Revelation chapter 21. And after the thousand years have run their course on this planet, renovated, of course, miraculously, so that it'll be from east to west and pole to pole like the Garden of Eden. It's going to be glorious. But nevertheless, Satan is going to come back for a short time and he will defile the whole. And once again, God will utterly destroy it. I think he's going to take out the whole universe. Now that will stretch your mind, won't it? You know, I've shared this before and I'm going to share it again. Quite a few years ago now, probably back in the middle 60s, I was taking a scientific journal, and there was an article in there by a scientist, a physicist, on the origin of the universe. And, of course, a lot of it was above my head and the mathematics and everything. But anyhow, his whole concept was that everything originated in one original source of light. And out of that source of light came everything of the universe and then, as we know, planet Earth and everything. But anyway... The exciting part was when he came to the end of his article, and he says, I can foresee that in the eons of time out into the future, someday that whole thing will go back into that original source of light. Well, I think, Iris, you probably remembered. I said, honey, this guy is closer to the truth than he has any idea, <laughs> because who is light? God is. And so if out of that source of light, which was God himself, we have the whole universe appear, and planet Earth and everything that's in it has all come from this original creator, then I can see that someday the whole thing will be pulled back into that original source of light because, because, now I guess I didn't intend to do this, oh, and I'm just flying free here. Before you go to Revelation 21, maybe we should stop at uh, Second Peter, I think it is. And let's just see how Second Peter describes what I think is going to be the demise of this whole universe. It has to happen because Satan has defiled everything. Second Peter chapter 3. Coming down to verse 10. And if this isn't perfect language for pulling everything back, and with God nothing is impossible. If he created it at the spoken word, he can pull it in. And here it is, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. But the day of the Lord. Now, you want to remember the day of the Lord is that whole timeline from the beginning of the tribulation on into the second coming and through the kingdom and right on into eternity. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens. Now, I feel that that's what we call space. And the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements, in other words, all the material that makes up our universe, and all the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, it's not going to escape. And the works that they're in, even though it's been a beautiful kingdom now for a thousand years, yet it's all going to go. And the works that are in shall be burned up, seeing then that all these things shall be Dissolve. Now, for those of you who are scientists, you'll realize that that's textbook language in chemistry and physics, right? See, I got a good doctor over here. I can always look to him. He nods right. Yeah, the elements, 
the elements. That's what makes up the atomic table. Isn't that the term for it? Yeah, it's been a long time since I've had it. But anyway, all these elements will melt with fervent heat, and they're going to be dissolved. My, if you've ever worked at a chemistry bench, isn't that the name of the game? Yeah, you see things just literally dissolve right before your eye. It's going to happen. The book says so. All right? And so these things are going to be dissolved. So consequently, Peter says, what manner of persons you ought to be of holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God. In other words, I feel this is the beginning of eternity, not the kingdom, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Hey, that's plain scientific language, as plain as you can get it. Nevertheless, Peter says, don't let that shake you up, because we, according to his, God's promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Now, th that's not gobbledygook, that's plain English. Now compare that with Revelation 21, where I trust you already are. And now this is John writing, but the same God. Revelation 21. <clears throat> and after the events that take place between the kingdom and the great white throne, the great white throne has been finished, the lost have sent to their doom, and now what's next on God's agenda? Verse 1. <clears throat> and I saw a new heaven, just exactly as Peter put it. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Now, that's the advent of eternity. See? All right, now then, what kicked me off on that was come way back again to Daniel. And so, after the thousand-year reign and the great white throne judgment has been accomplished, then I feel this whole universe will be pulled back into the Creator, and He will recreate new heavens and a whole new earth. Why? Because Satan has defiled everything, and nothing of Satan's defilement is going to go into our eternity. Now, that's the way I have to look at it. So everything will be brand new. Okay, now I'll come back to Daniel chapter 2, uh, 44, reading that again. <clears throat> it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms that have come out of the 6,000 years of human history, and it, this coming kingdom, shall stand forever. All right, now verse 45. For as much as thou sawest in your dream, in your vision, of this huge image with a head of gold, the chest of silver, the belly of brass, the legs of iron, and the feet and toes of iron and clay, standing there as a huge individual, out there maybe on the plains of the Middle East. And Daniel's vision says that all of a sudden, here came a stone cut out without hands. Now, whenever you have something accomplished without human hands, who's doing it? The invisible God, see? And this is a power of God that will crush, and it'll be in the person, of course, of God the Son, who will crush all the residue of those kingdoms, that is, toward the end of the tribulation, getting it ready for the kingdom, and he will crush the residue of those Gentile empires. And it broke in pieces, <clears throat> starting from the feet, the iron, uh, brass, Silver, the gold, the whole image, which is a picture of empires, remember, is going to be crushed and brown to powder. And so the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain in the interpretation thereof. Now, just stop and think a minute. Here this pagan oriental king got a picture in symbolism of the whole time of human history from 6 old B.C., to the advent of eternity. No wonder he was all shook up. He knew that this was something special. And that's why he was ready to kill all the wise men of Babylon to get down to the, to the root of the thing. And it was. It was the very picture 
of human history as we now look back on it. All right, now then verse 46. So after the interpretation is given to the king, he probably didn't get a gist of all of it, but enough to really make him pretty somber. <coughs> he fell upon his face, worshipped Daniel. Now you see that always happens when the pagans have some kind of a supernatural manifestation. They worship the guy that's in front of them. You know, they did to Peter, they did to Paul, and uh, this was no different. So he falls on his face, <coughs> worships Daniel, commanded that they should offer an oblation and sweet odors unto him, just as if he were another one of their gods. Verse 47, the king answered unto Daniel and said, Of a truth it is that your God, see now he's getting a little bit of a revelation, see? It's a truth that your God is a God of gods. He is supreme over all of ours. And he's a Lord of kings. And here we come again, as we looked in the last half hour, he's a revealer of what? Secrets. Because he knows the end from the beginning, but he doesn't tell it all. He keeps it secret until he's ready to reveal it. All right, so he's a revealer of secrets, seeing that thou couldst reveal this secret. So then the king made Daniel a great man and gave him many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon. And don't forget what we learned up there in chapter 2. How old is Daniel? He's just a lad. Even now he's only in his teens, see? But because God's hand was with him, he was perfectly capable to handle the role. And so he made him the chief of the governors over all the wise men of Babylon. And now verse 49. So then Daniel requested of the king on behalf of his three Jewish friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, over the affairs of the province of Babylon, but Daniel sat in the gate of the king. Now, if you know your Old Testament Bible, to sit in the gate meant what? Well, you were the top dog. That's what the term really meant. To sit in the gate meant that you were at the top of the heap. All right, so that was Daniel's role after telling the interpretation of the dream. Now let's move on into chapter 3, and we're going to get a glimpse now of how awful, how awful the morality and the immorality of these pagan ancients at the time of even the Roman Empire really was. And if you remember at the end of our last program, I was talking about why did the Jews, remember? Why do the Jews call the Romans dogs? Well, I'm going to show you right here. This is why. Because, see, the Romans hadn't improved a bit. If anything, they gotten worse. Nebuchadnezzar, verse 1. Now, remember, I'm going to show you why the Jews call the Romans dogs. Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits. Now, three score is 60, and a cubit was about a foot and a half, so that's about a 90-foot high column. All right? And the breadth thereof, six cubits, he set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, treasurers, in other words, all of his governmental people, all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Now, I do not dare tell a TV audience what this image really was. I'll let you do that yourself by the searching of Scripture. But it is so obscene, it is so immoral, and that's why God called it over and over an abomination. And I'll let you do that on your own. I'm not going to do it on a, on a public uh, program. But anyway, here's this great image now then. And they bring all the governmental bigwigs to celebrate the erection of it. And come down now to verse 4. Then a herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations and languages. See, it's a universal decree for that then known period of time. Now remember, as I said in the last half hour, 
The then known world was primarily the, what we call the Euphrates area, the Middle East, and the area around the nation of Israel in the Mediterranean Sea. They knew nothing of the Western Hemisphere. They knew nothing of South America or anything like that. And so even Europe was pretty much still out in the barbarian areas of history. All right, but nevertheless, he calls all the representatives of his empire together at the, at the dedication of this horrifically immoral image. That at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, the dulcimer, and all kinds of music. Ring a bell? What do we do today when you've got a big event? Well, you surround it with music. See, these guys weren't as ancient as you think they are. They, they were civilized, but they were so pagan and immoral in their worship. All right, now then, verse 5. That at what time you hear the sound of the music, you fall down and worship this golden image. Now, no doubt it was made of wood and covered with gold. All right? This image that Nebuchadnezzar the king hath set up. Now, I'm just going to give you a couple scripture verses to, to help us get an inkling. Come back with me to Ezekiel chapter 16. Ezekiel 16, verse 17. And then for those of you taking notes, we're going to go back and look at Numbers 33, 52. But let's look at this one first. Ezekiel 16, verse 17. And while you're looking up, let me remind you. Where did all this kind of gross, immoral idolatry begin? Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel. And you go back and, and you study some of that. There, there, there's a tremendous book. It, it's hard reading, and I don't like to recommend it, but it's called The Two Babylons by a guy by the name of Hislop, H-I-S-L-O-P. And I've read it at least twice, but, oh, it, it, it's laborious because it's such small print. But, see, he goes back and he, he constructs how all this paganism of the gods and the goddesses and how they would just unbelievable and yet these people bought into it and they weren't stupid they were intelligent people and yet they were so satanically consumed by this stuff that it became the very basis of their whole civilization see and archaeology is proving it archaeology is constantly digging up the worship of this horrible pagan society all right, Ezekiel 16, verse 17. Now, I'm going to take you all the way back to Moses, so just bear with me. Verse 17. Thou hast also taken thy fair jewels of my gold and my silver, which I had given thee. Now, God is speaking to the Jews, to Israel. You have taken the things that I gave you and made thyself images of of men and didst commit whoredom with them. With what? The images. See? They'd fall down and worship that vile, filthy image as part of their everyday worship. No wonder God had to take stringent matters. All right? And then the next one is Numbers 33, 52. And this is all along the same line. It's all dealing with the same kind of, of an idolatry. Numbers 33, 52. And those of you who are Bible students, you can carry on from here. And uh, it, it just, you wonder how God put up with it as much as he did. All right. Now, here's one of those chapters, you know, you, you really should read more of it than just one verse in order to, pick up the, uh, the flow of the whole chapter. But uh, here we're dealing with Israel preparing to go into the promised land. And the Canaanites have been there now for 400 years. And what was the prophecy? Now, I've got to keep testing you people so you don't forget what I've taught you. When God told Abraham he would have to wait 430 years before his children's children's children could go in and take the land, 
why was he going to have to wait so long? Because the iniquity of the Canaanites had not reached the full mark. Now here again, see, God knows the end from the beginning. And so God knew that these Canaanites were going to keep going deeper and deeper and deeper into gross immorality. And when they hit the full mark, then he's going to send Israel in with the command to do what? Kill every one of them. They were so vile. At what level were they? Dogs. And that's exactly why Israel called the Gentiles dogs. They had a dog's morality. See? All right. Numbers. Chapter 33, 52. My goodness, that half hour gone already. Start at verse 51. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When you are passed over Jordan into the land of Canaan, then you shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you, destroy all their pictures, destroy all their molten images, and quick pluck or take down all their high places, which were again images much like what uh, Nebuchadnezzar was speaking of in Daniel. Now, as I was preparing this over the last several weeks, we know that the world is coming full circle. Now, we're not to the place where we've got images in our backyard. But what is now in the living room of almost every home of any consequence around the world? The Internet. And what is the plague of all plagues on the Internet? I haven't seen it, fortunately. But, oh, I've had so many of the people in our center, they catch it accidentally. And it's awful. Pornography. Pornography. It's taking the world by storm. I get enough calls just in my little ministry from both men and women. My husband is all hooked on my pornography. Once in a while, a husband will call. My wife is hooked on pornography. Hey, it's the very thing that God was dealing with way back here in Israel's history. See? And so this is all part. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing, so that you realize that this isn't anything new. We're facing again. Now I've got 44 seconds. Yeah, 42. Come back quickly to Deuteronomy. Chapter 7, verse 1. Deuteronomy, chapter 7, verse 1. We'll have to do this quickly or I'm going to run out of time. When the Lord thy God shall bring into the land where thou goest to possess it, and hath cast out the nations before thee. See? And why is he casting them out? Because of their gross, vile immorality. Now, a lot of people think God's unkind and vicious. He had to or it would have totally destroyed his covenant people. And so, always remember, it's nothing new. It's just back on the scene. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.